how it could have been otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Are yeah. we ready to roll? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Faculty of Music. Um, my name is Nicholas Marston. That's all you need to know about me beyond what you can read about me and my distinguished colleagues, Christopher Wintle, Philip Ruprecht, Boyan Buich, Arnold Whittle, and Jonathan Dunsby in the uh, programme for this event celebrating Hans Keller's legacy uh, this afternoon. Uh, we are engaged on one reading in an act of victimization by overexposure, or well, so does uh, <coughs> Keller describe uh, the idea of an anniversary. If there's any point in an anniversary at all, it's a momentary pause. We stop at the traffic lights to reflect for a moment upon where we're going, or rather we know where we're going, or think we know, but we think about what it means, perhaps even about what it means to have got that far. Those, that is the opening quotation from the preface of Alison Garman and Susie Woodhouse's recent uh, book celebrating Hans Keller, a musician in dialogue with his times. And uh, I just happen to have noticed that there are some copies of this volume being sold at half price at the back of the room. Um, without further ado then, uh, having turned the traffic lights to red, I'll ask Christopher to give the opening of these five little reflections on Hans Keller at 100. Christopher, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone and thank you for coming. And like my four colleagues, I shall be focusing on just one aspect of Hans Keller's work. But first I shall wear my hat as editor of seven books of Keller's writings and give an overview of the field, and this might help those of you who are entirely new to uh, Hans Keller's uh, work. And that is to say, my paper is a classical fast movement preceded by a slow introduction. <laughs> Uh, and it is called Yesterday's Tomorrow? Question mark. As we know, speakers often like to end on a personal note. Yet today I shall contradict expectations and begin on a personal note. I was born in the closing weeks of the war. I should have been delivered in Hampstead, but the doctors moved my mother to Cricklewood to be out of the range of the D2 rockets that were then falling on London. I entered the world overdue at tea time on the 3rd of April 1945. The commuters were heading home. In one of the evening papers, the Standard, they could read the result of a competition for the best letter on what would you do with Hitler if he was caught? The winner was Mr. Hans Keller. <laughs> As a victim of the Gestapo himself, he wrote, he would subject the Führer to a searching psychological study before turning him over to whatever fate awaited him. The following day, he amplified this again in the standard. To prevent the success of future Hitlers, I argued, we need a more thorough understanding both of the social aspects of individual paranoic aggressiveness and of group paranoia. The path to such understanding had already been paved, he added, by Freud in Vienna and by Ernest Jones and Edward Glover in England. Almost 50 years later, in 1994, I edited Keller's Selected Essays on Music for CUP with Bayern Northcott. After long thought, we laid out the volume in three parts to reflect three fundamental components of his work. The first we called criticism, though we might have said metacriticism or psychology. Its five essays addressed the responsibilities of the critic, audience resistances, nationalism and internationalism, the threat to genius posed by the pursuit of mastery, and the diagnoses of normal and abnormal in composers and their work with comments on creative character. These were core topics. Even when Keller dealt with social, philosophical and political issues, psychology was still to the fore. 
We think of his books 1975, Jerusalem Dari, Music and Psychology, and Criticism. And today, Boyan Buyic will consider Keller as a critically minded philosopher. So Keller's response to Hitler was par for the course. Let me stick with the essays. The second part we called Composers and Their Music. Our intention was to map out Keller's repertory from Haydn and Beethoven through to Schoenberg, Britain and Maxwell Davies. Many others were excluded. The entries were, were for the most part significantly short. This is because Keller penned countless reviews and features for periodicals, notably The Listener and The Spectator, as well as essays for The Score, Tempo and Music Survey, which he co-edited as we shall later hear from Jonathan Dunsby. Indeed, he had several columns of his own. First performances, the half year's new music, the new in review, today's tomorrow, truth and music, the contemporary problem, and the Keller column. These we barely touched, leaving them aside for some future collection. <coughs> the only column to have been reissued to date is film music and beyond. Some of the composers we did include are the subject of their own books. The Great Haydn Quartets, Britain, and Stravinsky. Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 130, will appear later this year. Volumes on Schoenberg and Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto are still in the offing. That is to say, the very format of his writing encouraged a mix of past and present, of the historical and the actual. And shortly, Arnold Whittle will consider the actuality of Keller's views on harmony 40 years on. The third part of the book we called Towards a Theory of Music. The essays were mostly longer than before and came mainly from the score, tempo, and perspectives of new music. Mozart stood at the heart of Keller's theory, along with Haydn and Beethoven. Yet there were also entries on Schoenberg, on the speaking voice and symphonism, Britain on the all-male cast of Billy Budd, and Gershwin and Stravinsky on rhythm, as we shall hear from Philip Ruprecht. Some entries dealt head-on with theoretical topics, such as key characteristics and principles of composition. And the first entry included a forceful declaration of stance that is quintessentially dynamic. Whereas conceptual logic depends on predictability, musical logic depends on unpredictability. In the background is the sum total of expectations, in the foreground what the composer does instead. This part also included an introduction to functional analysis, FA. This appeared alongside a Mozart FA and an essay related to the first FA, Knowing Things Backwards. In fact, all 15 FAs have now been reissued. Word as though it is, FA addresses a clearly defined concept, the unity of contrasting themes, with the unity embodied in the musically concrete basic idea. Here, then, are the three main components of Keller's thought. The philosophical and psychological, the ancient and modern, and the dynamic and dialectical. In our discussion today, I modestly suggest, we should not betray the indivisibility of these components, nor treat Keller apart from the great Austro-German tradition to which he was an heir. Now, for us in Britain, all this involves a challenge. And to show why, I shall now briefly scrutinise a short essay from the spectator, Art as Departure, which appears in our volume, Essays on Music. It comes from 1980 and deals with Haydn's freestanding set of double variations in F minor for piano. Keller unpacks Haydn's title, Sonata. He argues that in general, music proceeds either by contrast or by variation. That in Haydn's structure, we have both. Contrast between two themes and alternating variations on each theme, and that the contrast represents <coughs> that between first and second subjects in classical sonata forms. More still, Haydn's innovation paved the way for others for the slow movement, say, of Beethoven's choral symphony. Shame upon musicology, cries Keller, in typically com combative mode, for failing to grasp the utter novelty before them. Well, here we are in the seat of musicology, and shamed musicology, I shyly submit, can answer back timidly on three fronts. 
First, Keller acknowledges that sonata form per se has nothing to do with this piece, yet equates Haydn's <coughs> title sonata with sonata form. Yet, as musicology knows, the term sonata has a back history with many applications. Corelli's Tree of Sonatas of the 1690s among them, and the first move towards using sonata to indicate sonata form seems to have come in 1796 with Francesco Galeazzi. As Haydn composed his variations in 1793, it is highly unlikely that he meant sonata in the sense Keller includes. Second, in the dedicatee's copy, Haydn added the subtitle, Un Piccolo Divertimento. Yeah. Keller calls this an ironical and crass understatement and nothing else. Haydn may well have been ludic. After all, he had formally, dis uh, sorry, but in 1793, piccolo divertimento could still denote an instrumental piece. After all, he had formally described his early keyboard sonatas and string quartets up to opus 20 as divertimenti. Piccolo, I suggest, indicates a little divertimento, a piece in just one movement. Third, Keller talks of two themes. Now, it is fair to describe the two melodies and the choral symphony's slow movement as themes, but what Haydn contrasts are not themes, but types of binary form. The first, a rounded binary in F minor, the second, a simple binary in F major, both with internal repeats. The weightier rounded binary is obviously principal, and the slighter simple binary, subsidiary. Although the two types have a long back history, the terms come from Tovey. Rounded binary has a return to opening material at the end of its second part, where a simple binary doesn't. Yet Keller seems at sea with the terms, uh, and I can give you chapter and verse uh, to prove it in discussion. Uh, and he also liked to face down Tovey. Here, though, I think it is Tovey who might win through. However, we should not throw out Keller's elemental baby uh, with uh, such musicological bathwater. The F minor variations do proceed according to do two different principles, contrast and variation, and Keller's typically elemental opposition is galvanizing. Yet when we read his remarks on the close of the piece, we are surprised that Keller has not deployed his own terms. He notes that Haydn ends with <coughs> a mammoth finale like coda. What he might have said is that Haydn sets out to end his variations conventionally with a restatement of the opening rounded binary form without repeats. Yet having aroused well-defined expectations, Haydn suddenly thwarts them by interpolating midway a charged fantasia-like exode, after which he resumes and completes his restatement, thereby gratifying our postponed expectations. Nothing indeed illustrates Keller's basic stance more persuasively. It is when the expected does not ensue, when the music meaningfully departs from it, that art starts, art that, art that tells anyway. Even so, musicology has three things to add. First, in the Gedanke manuscript, Schoenberg calls such an interpolation an island formation, and we can find plenty of examples elsewhere in Haydn, Opus 54, number no. 2, Finale, for example. Second, in music in general, there are two basic ways of handling contrast, measured transition from one extreme to another, or stark juxtaposition of extremes. These represent another elemental opposition. Haydn can do both, of course, though here it is juxtaposition that he exploits. Third, Haydn's finale embodies the most radical contradiction in Western classical music, between strict form, the rounded binary, and free structure, the fantasia. And this contrast between strict and free, the stable and the unstable, gives us a third pair of elemental oppositions to add to Keller's. However, at this point, the ghost of Keller enters the room. This is the apex of irony, he cries. Was it not I, Keller, who redefined the fundamental contrast in sonata form as that between statements and developments, including transitions? Well, he did. Though I still say sotto voce, with his Satsum gang, A.B. Marx may have got there a hundred years earlier. <laughs> At the end of Arthur's departure, Keller builds a bridge between composers' past and present. He writes, Monothematicism and polythematicism, these are the most fundamental contrasts in the creative approach, so sharply, as oppose, uh, so sharply opposed 
that there are great composers who, as a matter of creative character, can be described as monothematicists, Purcell, Britain, or polythematicists, the giants of the Austro-German tradition, although the latter did have countless affairs with monothematicism, as in the case of Mozart. The bridge allows Keller to add the dichotomy to his ongoing typologies of creative character, though we, of course, might add athematicism. Keller offers such typologies as supra-historical statements, <coughs> rather as Schiller did in 1795 with his distinction between naive and sentimental creative types, a dichotomy on which Keller drew in discussing Britain. I end on an impersonal note. <coughs> in general, Keller's offering by no means belongs to the world of yesterday, to the world of Thomas Zuss, Jimmy Greaves, and phony professions. On the contrary, as our age turns ever more to neurology, psychology and psychiatry in its attempt to understand what happens to us as we compose, perform and listen, Keller's elemental categories may still have a powerful part to play. As I've tried to show, Keller has not always been an easy thinker for us to absorb, absorb but he remains a hard one to ignore. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I apologise, I should have announced before we began that this session is being recorded both in a video and uh, on the audio equipment here and I, I hope that people are comfortable with that. Um, our idea for the panel is that the substantive discussion of <coughs> the five papers will, will follow uh, the presentation of the, the papers themselves, but I thought we might just take a moment after each one, if there are any questions purely of clarification for the audience that anybody would, would like to ask, there's a moment to do that now. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll simply proceed. All crystal clear, good, thank you very much indeed. Then we pass to Arnold Whittle, who is going to talk about Keller, Schoenberg and composition today. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like Christopher, I'm going to start on a personal note, although perhaps not quite as personal, uh, particularly in connection to Keller as uh, Christopher's um, beginning. Just last month, a British composer, Morgan Hayes, endorsed a comment I'd made in print about a recent work of his, music in which there is no definitive key but no absolute negation of key either. Whether or not we might term such music modernist, post-tonal, or even post-modern, it won't usually be thought of today as atonal. Indeed, there's long been evidence in critical commentary and analysis that composers, as well as music critic, as critics and theorists, can see the case for using Schoenbergian technical concepts, extended tonality, suspended or floating tonality, even on occasion pan tonality. And for using these concepts in sympathy with Schoenberg's own distaste for thinking of atonal as meaningful in relation to any real music. Well, obviously, there's no time today for a disquisition about the kind of analytical processes that might serve to prove the value of the statement that there's no definitive key but no absolute negation of key either in a particular piece by Morgan Hayes or anyone else. But it's worth noting that British contemporaries as different as David Matthews and Michael Finnessy have talked about pan-tonality. Matthews in relation to Tippett, Finnessy in relation to himself. I've not made a systematic survey, but I suspect that since the year 2000, there have been rather more essays and books about 20th and 21st century tonality than there have been about either atonality or serialism. And I'll have a little more to say about this material in just a moment. But between 1920 and, say, 1970, 
it was still possible to believe <coughs> that atonality and serialism could, in the fullness of time, push even extended tonality further to the margins with the prospect of consigning it fully and finally to the past. And maybe there are elements of such thinking in Hans Keller's portrayal of Schoenberg at the time of his birth centenary in 1974 as, quote, musical history's most tragic figure, its most uncompromising clarifier and its leading confuser at the same time. In Keller's contribution to the 1973 London Sinfonietta of Schoenberg and Roberta Gerard series, a contribution called Schoenberg and the Crisis of Communication, Keller wrote that it must have been shortly after the fourth string quartet of 1936 that the shock of atonality was at last totally assimilated and that 12-note technique had become as instinctive to Schoenberg as tonal language had been." End quote. If so, however, as the fourth quartet also shows, that now instinctive 12-note music had not become incontrovertibly atonal. And this circumstance lends even more force to Keller's consequent claim that the ensuing continued history of tonality, after 1936 that is, proved that Schoenberg had come too soon, thereby contributing decisively to the current crisis of communication, which Keller says is not merely, not even chiefly, produced by one musical language having split into several. The one language has also, over a considerable part of the contemporary scene, evaporated into none. Forty years on from Keller's thought, we might take his diagnosis even further, suggesting that today it's less a case of some composers seeming to be too soon, others too late. Rather, there's a pluralistic coexistence in an unsteady state whose boundaries are limited only by the preferences of those later composers who respond to, while also sometimes resisting, the seductively provocative examples of those among their mighty predecessors who did not think they were composing atonally, and that, of course, includes Schoenberg. I won't waste time on idle speculation about how Keller might have viewed the British contemporary scene in 2019 in comparison with that scene he was so negative about in 1973. Jonathan Harvey, a composer advised by both Britain and Keller, sought for a while, especially around the early 1980s, to compound the confusion by, as he put it, moving the bass to the centre, so that mirrored symmetries floating in space might supplant the rooted spectra of natural harmonics. But Harvey soon came round to a more spectral kind of thinking about post-tonal harmony, as have many, perhaps most, other composers since the 1970s. <coughs> as for music theory, recent studies of 20th and 21st century tonality have long since adopted the kind of diverse perspective well characterised in a two-volume symposium published by Steiner Verlag in 2012 and 2017, of which Philip Ruprecht uh, was one of the editors. And such enterprises coexist with the interval cycles of George Pearl's 12-tone tonality, Dmitry Timochko's notion of extended common practice, Daniel Harrison's overtonality, and even perhaps Julian Anderson's macrotonality to demonstrate just how pluralistic scholarly perspectives on post-1900 tonality have now become. Well, in clarifying Schoenberg's persistent duality so cogently, Keller identified the cultural quality of a modernity that appeared to have better chances of survival, a productive survival, if old and new were encouraged to converge or at least coexist. This meant that Schoenberg and also Berg 
provided more promising signals for the future of composition than Webern and the various followers of Webern who constituted the atonal serial avant-garde of the 1950s and 60s. Schoenberg and Baer can still provide technical stimulus to today's composers, even if serialism and atonality have tended to dissolve into various alternatives, minimalism, spectralism, interval cycles, working with metallic cells, and macrotonality among them. And in this post calerian context, we might even find it possible to rescue Schoenberg from Keller's claim that he was musical history's most tragic figure. It was indeed a tragedy for those who believe in radical revolution rather than in principled conservation that the potential of genuinely atonal serialism as explored by the young Boulez and others in Europe and by Babbitt and others in America, that this has not so far swept to victory and may never do so. Some have even argued that the apparent indestructibility of something like tonal and post-tonal music is part of a culture institutionally dependent on the survivability of something like capitalism. Be that as it may, the pluralistic compromises of the kind of music that Keller admired, that he truly understood, can surely be relied upon to remain salient as we approach the early 2020s centenary of those <coughs> first fully 12-tone compositions, which today are more, talk are more talked about than actually performed. In his 1959 review in Tempo <laughs> magazine of Rudolf Reiter's last book called Tonality, Atonality, Pantonality, A Study of Some Trends in 20th Century Music. In <laughs> review of that, Keller claimed that, quote, Schoenberg always composed very naively, often almost unconsciously, and that he was far less of a theorist than his strong intellect might lead one to assume. End of quote. Well, I can't obviously speak for composers, but the theorists and analysts drawn to work on recent trends in composition, the wariness of theory that Keller's comments display is well worth bearing in mind as we strive to keep our balance amid the turbulent currents of today's volatile musical materials. Thank you. Are there any immediate questions? I wonder if I could come in with the thought that I have expressed before. It was at a recital for the Radio 3 series of the second Schoenberg Quartet. And it does seem to me that Hans Keller is wrong when he says that Schoenberg arrived too early on the grounds that there was so much pseudo-tonal music around at that time. And that the radical wing of experimentation, that also needed organization. My point out what I do profoundly believe, and that is that the second string quartet is intra-tonal. No matter where or how each movement starts out, it ends up in a key. And as such, I find myself reminded of the only piece I know that isn't ultimately in a key is Bliss's Grey clouds, nuage green, through the log. Mm. And I think that uh, Schoenberg is in an, uh, a lovely situation, maybe. Also, the nature of the the questioning of the soul that he goes in for. I mean, Avatom, we have Charles Rosen who can explain chromatic saturation and the evolution of serialism. We have him talking about a suspension of distaste. On the, um, about Evarton and the probing into the subconscious, the um, unacceptable, supposedly socially unacceptable uh, passions of the human mind. I'm beginning to lose my way probably here. Please forgive me, but um, I believe that Schoenberg's logic, his rigor, this organization, if he had a beef, if he had a, a quarrel at all, it was with pseudo-tonal music. 
And I believe that he wanted, passionately wanted, to create something that effectively, as Hans Keller himself was to say in organizing the 12 pictures, something that was complementary to tonality. And I, I think, I, 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 if I may summarize, I think Charles Rogan talked chromatic saturation. I, I imagine everyone here will understand that. And then the discovery of a new diatonic feeling. Um, that was one of the things he was instinctively working towards. And so we get the second Schoenberg Quartet. And uh, we get, uh, I think that, I hope I'm not losing people, but I think that this is significant. Gershwin saying he wanted to compose something simple, like Mozart. Mozart isn't simple. But I think that the, the quest was something in reaction, something to emerge from, to very heavy um, chords, with all 12 pitches of the octave being sounded on every page after page after page in a bathroom just as they've been filled up earlier from Mozart and Beethoven in C minor on. I as hope that's clear. If you want to <laughs> well, perhaps we could slap me down perhaps we could just clear, perhaps we could just park, park, park that now and give, give Arnold a chance to, to di digest it and, and come back to it uh, in the discussion. Well, the yes, papers. I think it, it's, uh, it covers so many different potential mm -hmm. points that we'd better deal with that more fully later. As it, as it happens, uh, I think Gershwin is about to resurface <laughs> in Keller and Rhythm, relentlessly upbeat. <laughs> Philip Ruprecht. I have a little handout which I hope is authentically Kellerian pedagogical mood here. Um, so yes, Keller and Rhythm, uh, relentlessly upbeat. Hans Keller's interests stand in impressive swath of mid 20th century musical and cultural life. Garnham and Woodhouse's biography, as you've heard, uh, skillfully charts his prominent contributions to criticism and analysis, as well as his BBC radio work on talks, classical, new, and chamber music. Still, if HK himself were to eavesdrop Tom Sawyer-like on today's centenary panel, one suspects he would quickly dispatch attempts to shoehorn his writings into any Procrustean conceptual framework, let alone fix a historical legacy. Keller's thought was, as Christopher observes, nothing if not dynamic and dialectical. Perhaps he wouldn't be disappointed then if I sketch his ideas on musical rhythm which, to preview, I will punningly describe as relentlessly upbeat. It's not a topic one associates immediately with Keller's name, uh, rhythm, that is. And yet, he often wrote about rhythm. In the 1957 essay, Rhythm, Gershwin and Stravinsky, he speaks urgently of, quote, our time's rhythmic crisis. And that's a phrase he revisits elsewhere. In the, <coughs> the crisis, in, in sum, was a loss of rhythmic progression, post Schoenberg, post Stravinsky. Still, Keller rejected Adorno's 1940s claims that Stravinsky's music was rhythmically catatonic, rigid, or shock ridden. What Adorno was not hearing, Keller argues, is best understood with the counterexample of Gershwin's jazz in our ears. That was an ability to, to beat time against time. For Keller, in example A on your handout, it's Stravinsky's remarkable downbeats that we must hear above all, accented and elemental tack points. Stravinsky's, quote, statically intense tension for Keller opposes the flow of rhythm with rhythm itself. Stravinsky's downbeats are heavy because they're unprepared and preceded by silence or rest. He marks them in the score with dynamic emphasis, uh, sport center, and accent signs. And um, in example A, I've given the downbeats big down arrows. Mm -hmm. That's my an annotation. Uh, meanwhile, Keller was concerned that we recognize the parallel rhythmic force 
of musical rhythm, its upbeating quality, a forward-driving, urgent telos. Music's upbeats press forward, like Gershwin's fascinating rhythm, fleet-footedly pushing towards the next action. From this rhythmic flow, Keller argues, springs everything else. Quote, music of the Central European tradition flows. It is developmental music, end quote. The arrows and all my other examples record comments on up and down beat placement from Keller's great Haydn quartet book. An axiom in Keller's approach is that a phrase, quote, cannot contain more than one main action. The melody must not be cut up into pieces by intermediate actions. Most of his advice on specific passages springs from the desire to promote an unbroken musical flow. Hence his scorn for so-called Boccherini meter. This is when the players subdivide a mid-tempo 4-4 into ponderous half bars. In practical terms, Keller's frequent advice to players is to recognize upbeating phrases and clarify their progression to later arrivals within a phrase. So if you look at example B, this is from the Opus 20, number 2, Minuet. It begins with an antecedent phrase whose main accent doesn't arrive until bar 6. Quote, intermediate accent should be the very slightest, end quote. Players should not stress the minuet's notated 3-4 bars. To convey the point, Keller renotates re Haydn, uh, just below there on your handout, in a heterogeneous sequence of 5-4, 3-4, 7-4, and 6-4 time signatures. Having located downbeats, the player's job will be to calibrate the weightings of events within the phrase flowing towards them. For Keller, effectively, there are upbeats, and then there are upbeats. Notated anacrusis gestures offer a whole range of accentual distinction. Keller's fifth functional analysis of Opus 50, number 5, wordlessly explored the elegant turning motion of the minuet's melodic upbeat. And he returned to the piece verbally in the Haydn book. And this is your uh, example C. That's on the second page. Um, so, of example C, he writes, There is all the difference in the structural world between the upbeat to bar 5 and the upbeat that isn't the upbeat to bar 1. End quote. The main accent for Keller, the real aim of the phrase, however, is in bar 8, the end of the phrase. Any earlier accents must look forward to this arrival. So going back to the violin opening, the solo violin then, quote, mustn't be disturbed by the slightest accent, end quote. Similarly, the upbeat turns into, into bars 5, 6, and 7, carry much less weight than the closing cadence in bar 8. Accent here also relates to the tempo definition. First violinists, he suggests, might linger over the solo, allowing the lower voices when they enter to supply a forward-urging upbeat energy. Um, look at the bottom of the page. The trio reshapes the accentual patterns. Haydn's bar three sforzato, uh, forzando actually in this edition, heralds the phrase's extension and a bold swerve to A flat major. The players, quote, <coughs> should aim at a main accent that never comes, but is replaced in its turn by a piano that's prepared by a diminuendo and whose purpose is the definition of the overlapping function of bar 5's third sequence. <coughs> that A flat in bar 5, I put a question mark next to that, <coughs> it's piano in Keller score, though not in Haydn's manuscript, is Janus faced. It's both a goal and thus a potential downbeat <coughs> of the opening phrase and the launch of new upbeating energies. Follow Haydn's dynamic shadings, Keller advises, and you'll capture all this. Keller's reading of arrival points as projected by relevant accentual strength is supported by insights into the movement's 
wider motivic and tonal endings. This trio, he notes, inverts the usual minuet trio balance. Quote, Far from relaxing the structure, the trio represents the climax of instability. And if you listen to the full movement, you, this is indeed it's a brilliant insight. The, the interplay, the minuet and the trio, is one among phrase rhythms. The tensions will be projected by dynamic and accentual detail. Keller's blunt practical notes to the players in the Haydn book, the accent goes here, not there, spring from a multifaceted reading not only of entire movements, but of the complete piece, all four movements. Same example D. Keller often homes in on Haydn's sforzato markings. Notes thus accented may serve to de-accentuate a more obvious downbeat option. So if you look at example D, the opening of opus 64, number one, Keller counsels no accent on the first downbeat, lest you split the phrase by creating a competing accent between bar one and bar two. Though he does concede that even in the most distinguished circles, uh, the players disregard this. With his sophisticated understandings of phrase rhythm, Keller is well placed to interpret Haydn's polyrhythmic gains. Uh, my final example, example E, in the Alla Zingaresi <coughs> minuet of Opus 20, number four, this works best, Keller finds, if the violin melody is phrased as a gavotte, beginning mid bar, each forzando or forzata um, in marking a bar line. Meanwhile, the cello and the viola have a competing 4 4 string out of phase with the melody. Closing glimpses of Keller's criticism book, composed in 1976, I think he was on the beach at the time, actually, yeah. but published posthumously, allow us to see his rhythmic insights whole. Keller's constant attention to accent placement embodies his love of exemplification, of thinking by ostensive definition rather than in lofty abstraction. His observations on rhythm, like those on motives or themes or key relations, at one level treat what he calls local meaning. Individual musical thoughts, discrete moments in music's discourse, moments the players must get right for the audiences to hear the piece. But local meaning ultimately communicates larger structures. Quote, local meaning does not forget total meaning. End quote. And while local meaning is graspable in discrete, discrete gestures, the total meaning is something more elusive. Hence, wordless functional analysis. Hence, is a his attacks on one of the phony professions he himself practiced, press criticism. Keller insists throughout the criticism book that musical logic is not conceptual or verbal. Where conceptual logic respects laws of identity or contradiction, music will never work that way. Quote, a motif or phrase can only accumulate meaning in the course of a composition if it does not remain what it is. To evince musical logic, it must develop into something else and yet remain itself." End quote. Here, I'd say, is the final importance of Keller's concern with downbeats and upbeats. A phrase must progress. It cannot stand still. An arrival point must declare itself unambiguously <laughs> It cannot be vague. The drive of the line should be fluent. It cannot be broken by accents. The rhythmic foreground must convey a deeper background, or the music making will lack true phrasing. Such things can be stated or exemplified, but in the end, they can only be realized in some ongoing act of musical synthesis in the performance, fusing the local and the total. The accent you hear as perfectly timed requires the player's sometimes intuitive ability to gesture unerringly at that precise moment in that way. <laughs>
As Keller knew so well, such moments are sacred to the world of the performance. For within each beat, bar, or phrase, no moment will ever come again. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just, Philip, can I just ask briefly, yeah. I would take it that what Keller is talking about in many of your examples is what Cone would describe as the, the notion of structural downbeat. I mean, do, do you see yeah. those things as the same, or do you I think that some distinction? I think that's absolutely right. Um, and, I mean, this came up in... Arnold alluded to this question of how, how closely Keller's musical thinking is grounded in what we think of as music theoretical thinking. Hmm. And he might well have been, I would assume, aware. I, I'm sure he would have been aware of, of Cohn's work, which is from the 60s. Hmm. Um, hmm. He also was aware of uh, Hugo Riemann's 1879 uh, treatise on rhythmic yeah. downbeats. And yeah. he alludes to that in the Gershwin Stravinsky. Uh, but he doesn't say much about it. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he sort of gives you a capsule view of yeah. it. So, um, I mean, we can maybe come back to that a little sure. more. But, but uh, yeah, I think that's a, a fair assumption. Thank you. Yeah. John, briefly. Can I ask, uh, picking up on that, uh, for some clarification, um, uh, the attention to accent could potentially be misleading. Uh, yes. Because I think what really matters, and I suspect that Kelly's going at, although you can perhaps be warm up, is, is what is his estate in trajectory? And Absolutely. If you think about yeah. uh, going way back before Cohen, there was a famous uh, comment in Rachmaninoff that the culminating point has to be approached in precisely the right way and moved away from in precisely the right way, and the phrase collapses. And this is what I mean. Mm. Of course, it's right at the heart of what all performers are doing, and we're aiming at the culminating point, yeah. saying you've already approached all the technique to change. And I just wonder if that's really what's at stake here, rather than an accent point. It, 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 perhaps the turning point in the progression there. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right <laughs> in that if you look at the, the great Haydn Quartet's book, it's, it's not about accent in oh, Haydn, exactly. but in every discussion of the minuets in all 45, he comes back to this question of accent. And, and I, I'm summarizing and just giving you a little bit, but yeah. He is saying these things, you know. He didn't have the arrows, I put those in. But he does have musical examples, and he does the rebarring. And uh, we, I think Christopher has a question about this as well, and we'll get back to it. But I think the question of accent, to be brief, is a shorthand for a lot of things, including... But it's this dynamism. Yeah, you yourself used the word, uh, I think it's coming from here, but progress. progress yeah, absolutely. Comes, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've subjected... <laughs> our next speaker to a long enough anacrusis. Yes, there so you go. <laughs> we're waiting for a downbeat. We're, we're, we're waiting for the downbeat from Boyan Vujic. Boyan, the floor is yours. Right, I will go decidedly downbeat <laughs> into something completely different. I shall start by quoting from Fritz Mautner's Beiträge zu einer Kritik der Sprache. I have heard a melody. I remember it. I, I sing it inwardly. I do not succeed in singing it correctly, but I experience a certainty that I remember it wrongly, i.e. I compare the nerve agitation caused by my inner singing, which is wrong, with the residual disposition of the nerve agitation caused by the correct melody. This process is no other than that on which rest all our concepts and words, all our thinking and speaking. Now, softening Mautner's extreme skepticism, we may suppose a more encouraging situation. That is, that we remember a piece of music correctly. We can recall it after a fashion, but we lack the mental constructs which would lead us from the initial process of remembering towards a closer familiarity, that is, understanding. Yet another of Mautner's <coughs> contentions warns us that knowledge is limited in that it results from a transfer or translation of sensations into concepts whereby something is always lost. Hans Keller may not have known Mautner's work, but he had the instinct of a critically-minded philosopher and explored the same territory, although his skeptical bent may have been less pronounced than Mautner's. <laughs> 
I don't know, and my colleagues may be able to, to throw more, li more light on this, to what extent Keller was aware that he was not starting from a philosophic critical point of innocence and originality, yet consciously or not, he slotted himself into an intellectual tradition which had a strong Austrian lineage. Although active in Germany, Mautner, just like Gustav Mahler, was an Austrian, more precisely, a Bohemian German Jew, and is considered one of the representatives of Austrian spirit in German philosophy. A stream wary of idealist schemes favored by the German followers of Ke Hegel. Again, whether or not Keller thought himself as an Austrian intellectually speaking, or whether he was more inclined to see himself as having embraced the English common sense and the dislike of obfuscation, he certainly fits into the lineage of the critique of language, which had strong roots in Austrian thought. The distinction between the two Germanophone schools ensured a great n greater openness of British philosophers to the influences emanating from Vienna, while they kept the themselves at a distance from German idealist philosophy. It is not just Mahatma who serves as a useful point of departure when looking at the deep roots of Keller's attitude to music and to conceptualization. An obvious source is the thought of Karl Krauss. Krauss's influence on the members of Schoenberg's circle has been discussed extensively, first by Alexander Goer and then by Julian Johnson. Well, I now would like to draw parallels between Krauss and Keller, though with half an eye on Mautner. The art of music criticism, Keller warns us, has been invented as a shield behind which one can write about oneself without anybody <coughs> noticing anything amiss, unless he wants to. In proportion, as one experiences and so understands a work of art, one loses interest in its evaluative criticism. Criticism is a symptom of incomprehension and misunderstanding. Leaving aside the question of whether this is or isn't overstated, it is possible to see that Keller's words have respectable origin in Mautner and Krauss. Mautner claims that metaphor is a medium of cognition in the process <coughs> of investing language with meaning. The trouble starts when metaphors assume a life of their own, and instead of aiding the process of formulating concepts, they become independent language constructs. It is as if, going back to Mautner's remembered melody, the process of testing one element of the experience or memory against the, its imperfect imprint on the senses is abandoned, the required dialectical process is interrupted, and the, quote, wrongly remembered experience is honored by being channeled towards a series of language substitutes, the metaphors which now serve simply as vehicles for the speaker's or writer's own fantasy. <coughs> as Karl Krauss put it, the clash between truth and metaphor is always a catastrophe. Keller, in multiple instances when discussing the nature of criticism, addressed a similar issue, or rather danger. When critics abandon their search for truth, they're likely to substitute their own verbal constructs. They write about themselves. All conceptual thought about music is a detour from music via terms to music. This is Keller. This is, as we all know, his rationale for the functional analysis, an intellectual project which, when seen against the long tradition of language skepticism in Austrian thought, marked the somewhat belated appearance of the principle of skepticism in the philosophy and theory of music. By belated, I mean that it was formulated by Keller several decades after the basic issues of the inadequacy of language were first treated Austrian thought. We may go back even to Hugo von Hofmannsthal's The Letter of Lord Chandos and to the imaginary English aristocrat's despair over the inadequacy of language as a bearer of expression. Even the same paradox is evident. In 1902, Hoffmannsthal's Chandos, and the, the letter of Lord Chandos was written, written 
published in 1902, significantly the same year when Mautner's last volume of the Beiträge was also published. Ch Hoffman starts Chandos lamenting over the inadequacies of language through a piece of exquisitely crafted prose, and Keller too, in order to question the validity of description as a means of understanding music, submitted, as he would have said, his carefully argued thought in equally carefully constructed prose. It comes down, then, to the moral responsibility of the writer to choose what he needs to say and how to say it. And here again, we have a theme repeatedly addressed by Krauss, as if to bestow a certain linguistic sparkle on a significant fragment of thought. Krauss often employed what Edward Timms described as his, I quote, skill in teasing subversive mutations out of familiar phrases. So, in his 1932 essay, Die Sprache, Krauss describes the need for a responsible use of language by selecting two words with sonorous identities but lexical differences. Die Verantwortung der Wortwahl. Die schwierigste, die es geben sollte, die leichteste, die es gibt. And I have been wondering whether Keller had this sonorous pair of words somewhere in his subconscious when coining the twilight of twaddle. <laughs> After its appearance in Die Fackel, Krauss's essay was reissued in 1937 in a volume of writings on language by Krauss. And if we bear in mind that the young Keller was a voracious reader, he might, just might, have encountered it in his last year at school. There is indeed a lively spirit of Krauss in Keller. Krauss was fond of starting his polemical writings not by broaching the readers gently, working on the captatio benevolentiae, but by stating his intentions provocatively. Back in 1899, in the program for the Fackel, Krauss said in the introduction to the first issue, that it was not a declaration of what we are going to do, bringen, but what we are going to undo, umbringen. This he plays on a German also uh, pun, which is not adequately translated to, by me, but it's the only way I could bring together, bring and uh, umbringen. So, and there is still an echo, it still is audible in Keller. There have been always between two types of reaction to music. One has been the Ken Russell type, and the other has been the boring type, which is my type, <laughs> and how we may wish that Keller would have bored us a little longer. <laughs> Just a, uh, a footnote, a benign footnote uh, to Boyens, um, and uh, in saying that there is uh, Keller is a late arrival um, in uh, uh, a group of uh, thinkers: um, Krauss, Martin, and Hoffmannsthal. Um, the one he particularly picked out uh, as the background to his wordless functional analysis was Oswald Spengler. Uh, and the decline of the West in 1927. Um, and this is what uh, he wrote when he was talking about functional analysis. Um, as soon as, this is his translation, as soon as the word which is communicated as a sign of understanding becomes a means of artistic expression, human awareness ceases to express or perceive as a whole. Even verbal sounds that are used artistically, not to speak of the red word of higher cultures, the medium of literature proper, separate imperceptibly hearing and understanding, for inevitably the usual meaning of a word continues to play its part. Under the influence of literature's ever-increasing power, then, the wordless arts themselves have arrived at modes of expression which link their motives to verbal meaning. Uh, that, that supports... Uh, yeah, that it, it seems to me that 
admittedly, if he's picked it up from Spengler, and it's not a sort of name that one wants to quote too often, one can avoid it if one can. I thought that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then uh, I would say that Spengler picked it up from the uh, language skepticism of the preceding 20 years or so, particularly Mautner, <coughs> um, who indeed had a very um, wide-ranging influence. He was a theater critic as well as a uh, really theorist of language. The philosophers, particularly of the English bend, deny him a status of a philosopher, mm -hmm. but in a very important sense, he was a philosopher of language. Um, so it, it seems to me that there is there's no um, break here. There, there is some continuity. And um, I just wanted to go back to Keller's properly Austrian roots. Mm. I don't know to what extent he was aware of them. We can talk about that later. I don't want to add any more. Okay. Let us then finally <coughs> move to Jonathan Dunsby. Uh, who is going to round off this uh, quintet of reflections on Hans Keller. Thank you. Uh, delighted to have been invited to take part in that. And what I've just been listening to brings to mind one of my favourite lines from Karl Krause's Truths and Half-Truths, uh, a line that might seem bizarre at first, uh, where he writes... Anyone who has something to say is cordially invited to stand up and keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I was also not intending to say this, but I'm reminded following this uh, remarkable group that we've just heard of uh, one of my favorite lines of actual criticism by Hans Keller. And as I'm speaking now of the cup, I can't remember. I think it was about the music of Richard Addison, but I'll stand corrected. It doesn't matter who it was. Christopher knows his quotation. But Keller wrote that every piece he wrote was better than the next. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, my starting point for thinking about Keller's impact and influence was to revisit a point long ago in 1982 when I made an intense study of uh, music survey, which had appeared uh, between 1949 and 1952, inclusive, and which Faber republished in book form in 1981. Of course, Keller was far from solely responsible for the extensive content of music survey, but it bore the stamp of his incisive musical and intellectual personality. Uh, and I'll take the liberty of quoting my own somewhat embarrassingly ecstatic closing words uh, from a quite long and detailed editorial I wrote about that publication in the journal Music Analysis. Quote, The prophetic injection by Mitchell and Keller of analytico-critical discourse into the English manner of criticism a manner based all too often on cultivated ignorance rather than modest investigation, <laughs> has had far-reaching consequences which should be reconsidered or considered for the first time by a wide audience. Music survey provided at its best in the relatively tough study of Britain's lovable music and the loving study of Schoenberg's tough music a lesson in musical integrity. The lesson may doubt nowadays have a different relevance, but it's no less urgent." End quote. To be frank, I can't claim to remember now quite what I meant in 1982 by the idea of relevance compared with 30 years earlier, other than as a dutiful nod to the march of history. But you can see the point there that Keller is being credited with a major role in driving the shift that was occurring in my own youth, as it happens, towards what I call musical integrity. With hindsight, it strikes me that nowadays I'd be just as happy to call it intellectual integrity, especially if we take on board, as I do in the light of experience, 
Keller's categorical distinction between the conceptual and the strictly musical, to which Phil was just referring. I have a particular fondness for Keller's posthumous 1987 book, uh, Criticism, not because it necessarily conveyed ideas that are not to be found in his other copious writings, but because there was a concentrated and perhaps somewhat mollified Keller here. At the time, criticism, and I mean the book as a whole, came over to me as a narrative of persuasion rather than admonition, the kind of rare, sustained piece of writing from which, in reading, one was really, as Pierre Boulez might have said, learning about oneself. There was, of course, the showman side of Keller. And so for a young Turk such as I was, passionately disrespectful of what he called the, quote, pernicious criticism that hides inside description, and which he also called creeping criticism, I don't mind recalling how I cringed during his talk at, for instance, the Bath College in 1979 about Britain's third string quartet, a masterpiece that was then a mere four years old. Uh, when Keller evoked the image of toothache in respect of the first movement's primary zone material of alternating ma major seconds, some of you may remember that, and be maybe old enough to remember it. Not that Keller needed any lesson from me in the ethics of descriptive imagery, but the fact is that you cannot unsay such things, especially when delivered by such an authoritative and engaging commentator as we all know he was. By the way, the image of toothache as some kind of description of Britain's dissonant writing did not find its way into the 1979 essay <laughs> entitled Britain's Last Masterpiece, uh, published by Christopher in the superb 1994 book of Keller's Essays on Music. And a good thing too, one might dare to say, since offering the listening public loaded metaphors of some kind of purely illusory musical meaning is not exactly an escape from the English manner of criticism referred to in my earlier self-quotation. This kind of experience led me in the early 1980s when my interactions with Hans Keller were at their peak in his role as advisor to the new journal Music Analysis to give a lot of thought to his own ethical position. As a matter of record, although it is in fact Christopher who takes the lion's share of credit for the initiation and early character of music analysis, Keller was a formidable presence behind the scenes. He not only lobbed the most telling questions and judgments in the direction of my editorial office, but as I well recognized at the time, by being such an intensely challenging interlocutor on questions of musical value and critical responsibility, he also gave one the confidence to stick to one's decisions in the face of no matter what opposition. Particularly, for example, when he accused me of spending most of my own print efforts in my own research in apparently trying to prove other people wrong, I realized that while one might be casually almost aping Hans Keller in the apparently aggressive attitude towards other people's ideas, in fact, he himself had a truly stable epistemological system. When he seemed to be attacking something, it was out of conviction. It was for him, to use Schoenberg's phrase, an inner necessity. Personally, I think that the ever-present sense of crisis or even conflict in Hans Keller's writings, a perception that perhaps you share with me to this day, was therefore about exactly what he said it was, about the difficulty of identifying the necessity for criticism. And, as a final word, I hope that Keller will remain a model for future generations in how that difficulty can and must be overcome. Thank you.
cringing at the toothache image could not be a better example of Krause's the clash between truth and metaphor <laughs> is always a catastrophe. So there's a nice link between those two, two papers. Um, well, thank you to all our speakers. We have about half an hour uh, available now for uh, further discussion. Christopher has very helpfully um, prepared questions which might form a sort of postscript to each of the papers. But may I suggest that perhaps we begin by uh, inviting the audience who've sat so, uh, so patiently through our discussions to open the batting. Yes, please. I'd like to ask, in view of what you said, mm -hmm. um, I'm somebody who heard you speak on BBC. I'm, I'm actually old enough to have heard mm -hmm. um, Pepe done on the first BBC broadcast of it and been rather puzzled in, by in the words in 1957. Attached. But I want to ask something more fundamental than that. Yeah. Um, although one was struck by his writing very much indeed, I, am, um, I wonder in the light of what you said about accents, mm. he handled a composer like Bartok. I never heard him say a word about Bartok. Mm. Now I may be wrong, and he did. Yeah. And also, um, Bartok, somebody who was outside the Austro-German tradition, right. and also the Finnish um, one of Sibelius, yeah. too. And the two, always for me, very um, striking examples of composers who don't, um, can't be analysed in that same way as Hans Keller did. They depend on the rhythms um, of Finnish speech, even, and, and of course, Bartok's um, um, suddenly snapping into folk dances, although mm. he didn't write them himself, uh, just read. Um, I'd rather like to know what you think was he locked in the Austro-German? Well, uh, as, as Susie said earlier, I think Haydn was really close to his heart, and, and, and Mozart. And so I think that's, uh, and the, the, the Viennese classical tradition, and then with Schoenberg as a, an honorary uh, yeah. you know, 20th century representative of that, and then the, the love of Britain. Um, I don't know whether he wrote much about Bartok. I suspect rather he didn't. Um, he has one essay in Music Review uh, where he sort of apologizes for not getting Sibelius. And he, um, he says, I'm not going to write about Sibelius because I just I don't understand him. But he doesn't say he's no good. He's not like Rani Leibovitz, who wrote a whole pamphlet that says, Sibelius is le plus mauvais compositeur du monde. You know, he trashes Sibelius. You know, but, uh, but Keller uh, doesn't get Sibelius, and he, he just says, I'm not going to go there. Uh, I suspect with Bartok, you know, the comparison will be Stravinsky, and you heard what he thinks about Stravinsky. He's fascinated by the, the vigor of the downbeats, and he thinks Adorno is, is totally wrong about that. You know, that Adorno is not hearing these downbeats, they're not shocks. I think uh, the short answer would be with Bartok, it probably wouldn't have interested him so much because the dance rhythms, they're not symmetrical dance rhythms, so they wouldn't qualify as sort of the. Yes. You know, and, and so they don't fit right. and they're, they're, they're too obvious uh, you know what he's interested in the tension between the foreground and the background and yes. he's interested in all the minuets in the Haydn book yes. between the background of the notated meter and the yes. foreground which is very uh, asymmetrical and full of interesting accents so but in fact if you take a work like Bartok's third string quartet mm -hmm. I wonder what he would do with that because yeah. the folk dances are not to the fore. It's mm. linear counterpoint, mm. which figures very strongly. I, had he had he engaged himself with the part of his third quartet, he would have found out that there was a lot there going on of the same kind of motivic filigree workout mm. that he had actually identified in Mozart. We're talking about Haydn, but he talks about Mozart as a composer of the detail. Mm, that's right. And uh, 
in, in Bartok's third quartet, you could see an extraordinary mix uh, of uh, a motif which then gets extended to a slightly longer motif in which each of the uh, longer notes or stressed notes of the second motif is actually the basic structure of the first. So that uh, I, understand. I think had he thought about that for a moment, he would have realized that that's not outside his canon's orbit. I understand. <coughs> Could I just have a footnote? There is no sustained piece on Bartok by Hans Keller that I know, um, and uh, 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 Alison, who's the archivist, uh, is agreeing with me. Um, what he did say about Bartok is he was the only great composer of string quartets who wasn't a string quartet player. He was mm -hmm. Bartok was the exception, proved the rule, and he used to talk a lot about that Haydn and Mozart were string quartets. Uh, they played from the viola um, and whatever, but Bartok was the exception of the proof of the rule. Mm -hmm. I point out, I think it's a fingerprint that reveals a great deal. He talks somewhere in music surveys about Schoenberg being too civilized to use quarter tones. I think Bartok is almost beyond the pale. There's a, a, an intimation mm -hmm. of that, that Bartok's uh, non. Yeah, there's, there's something that's beyond the pale for, for yes, that, for that's very that's very 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 Austrian, and uh, you know who is in Cisleitanian and who is a Transleitanian. In the Transleitanian, they are funny. You know, Balkan begins am Ringweg, as Metternich said. Mm. Um, th 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 there's a lot behind that. What you say. With how much more of Adorno's work did he engage? I mean, did he did he engage with any of the diagnoses of late Beethoven, for example? Um, well, there is an early review of uh, uh, Adorno's uh, philosophy of new music, mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, uh, in which he rejected uh, his arguments. Um, I had a correspondence with him uh, about. About, about that, and it's partly in Alison's book, uh, there, and it's also in the um, it's also in the library archives. Good. Uh, I can't remember exactly what we said very much, but no. we did have a correspondence. Mm -hmm. May I <coughs> may I just add there something? Um, uh, pot and kettle, black, etc. He objects to Adorno's German archaisms oh, yes. and points out which grammatical forms he uses and how. Hans Keller, who all the time talks about fiddle and uses all these uh, abbreviations you know, like would and use and submit, mm. um, he didn't <coughs> see himself in that. Mm. I don't know. Another question? Yeah. I think I've asked this question to Boyan, but it may also be something that Alison may have asked you. Um, I don't know. I, I have hardly. I, I've met Keller twi twice in the 1960s. You see, I never, I never even referred to him as Hans because I don't think I'm <laughs> close enough <laughs> to uh, claim yeah. that. So um, I don't know. And the, the, the two little in conversations that I had with him, he wasn't particularly what the Germans or the Austrians would call entgegenkommend mm -hmm. uh, when I when I addressed him. So I must stand outside. Yeah, you I know his writings. And I that's mean, I learned an awful lot from your com what you just told us about it really reminded me of where he was coming from. Yes. And I think as a student, it would have helped me a lot to know more of that kind of thing, more explicitly of that kind of background and that kind of guidance <coughs> that he was hoping for and expecting from people that he interacted with. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Christopher uh, has a 
Well, well, I remember him very much when uh, he came to Goldsmiths College, where I was teaching at the yeah, time. Yeah, he um, And yeah. uh, I remember him teaching classes and also in these seminars. And actually, there was an issue that really touches on what uh, Arnold was saying. Mm. Um, and this is uh, uh, when he talked about Schoenberg and return to tonality, and then saying that Schoenberg had never left tonality at all. Um, and then we got locked into a discussion about uh, the third string quartet, whether actually there was still tonality behind the string quartet, and he said if you play it very slowly, you can still hear mm. functions going yeah. on. And then we started uh, challenging him and saying, what about this passage of Schoenberg and this passage of Schoenberg? Can you really, really hear that? Um, and he got very easily cornered, actually. Mm. Um, but that uh, issue was something he didn't easily let go. And I think Arnold will probably remember about that. Mm. Um, and uh, he was much better uh, if you had supper with him before a class and you talked like you and I are talking <laughs> in private, you know. Um, but... Uh, uh, he could be put on the spot because it was uh, ideologically important for him to say that there was no con yeah. discontinuity yeah. between Schoenberg, the totally advanced yeah. tone composer, and Schoenberg, the composer of uh, twelfth tone music. Whereas for some of the rest of us, um, there, w that there was uh, there was really was a tension about it. Um, and from that point of view, um, uh, uh, he was rather confrontational. Um, yeah. Better in private, I would say. I, 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 would, I would like, if I may, at this point, to um, pick up um, on uh, Christopher's comments, questions about my subject, my piece, because I think it follows now from, you, we, we've already brought Schoenberg into the yes. mix, as it were, and, um, but this is an answer to a question I haven't asked you. I mean, well, you um, I that? will explain, yes. um, if I may, um, to, to may. the assembled group. It, it won't take a minute, but I think it's um, because what we've been talking about so far, I think, in this more general discussion is the possibility that Hans Keller's range was narrow or limited in a way which perhaps is not necessarily common or, or frequent in, in what he was willing to write about as opposed to what he was willing to listen to. And, uh, and so the issue of Sibelius and Bartok or whatever comes into it. And um, uh, since in my piece I mentioned as an example of a composer who thinks about or thinks he thinks about pantonality, I mentioned Michael Finnessy, the uh, living composer. Um, Christopher had uh, discovered that um, Keller did once mention Finnessy uh, quite late on, I think it was. W was this in, a, in print or just in...? Uh, no, it was in print. In print, in yeah. Print, uh, um, and he said that um, uh, he described a piece of Finnessy's as contemporary music at its most characteristic, characterless harmony. Characterless harmony. And you see, to me, that's a, a very interesting and revealing interpretation of Finnessy and the many composers whose music may be to some extent like his, because um, my immediate reaction was that, uh, all right, the harmony can't be characterized in the way that we would characterize Haydn's harmony or Beethoven's harmony or Brahms's harmony. But uh, to describe it as, by definition, without character um, is, suggests a, a, an unwillingness to um, reimagine music as contemporary composers evidently do imagine it. And I would also you know, I would fall back and say that um, even if the harmony is, by some definition, without character, the style of the music is not. So how we're going to define Michael Finnessy's sound and uh, how we're going to differentiate Michael Finnessy from X, Y, and Z among living composers is um, an interesting issue for criticism. But um, it, it's... Am I, am I uh, wrong in, in thinking that Keller was, in a way, simply characterising Finnessy as a non-classical composer. He, he was, in effect, saying, this is not harmony, 
in the way that I love it in Haydn and so on. And um, mm. leaving it at that, that, that was the end of it. Yeah. Uh, I would hesitate ever to speak for Hans, but I but think it would be uh, a complex yes. Uh, yeah, yes, 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 I, I, I think uh, it has to be, doesn't it? Uh, um, I think actually the question mm. um, about uh, character uh, the late character was one that had sorry, was it? No, 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 I, no. I was just uh, encouraging you. To oh, right. this. Um, <laughs> Hans, in the last two or three years, got very obsessed by this lack of character. Ah. Um, and uh, one of the features of Schoenberg's fundamentals of musical composition, uh, and this is the basis of my question to Arnold, mm. uh, was that uh, Schoenberg showed with musical line how you can raise character how you can push character back, how you can dissolve mm. character yes, entirely. Yes. So there's a fluid idea mm. of mm. Uh, uh, um, character, and uh, it's a tremendous thing to think about. And indeed, uh, mm. when we talk to Hans, it's about that kind of character. Yes, yes. Um, now, uh, the question to you was, um, uh, is uh, uh, you're concerned about harmony, um, but Schoenberg's concern was that character really started with line and the harmony yes. came with it. Mm. Um, and I, my question to Arnold, which was a naughty one, uh, was shouldn't we really be talking about characterless line as the problem of our yes, day yes. and not that? And there's a footnote to that because you talk about the spectral movement, which came after uh, Hans, really. Uh, sure. And for a time, I was in with Gerard Aguise, you remember, he came to Kings and so on. Yes. Um, and of course, uh, in sort of French way, everything went up from the bottom up, and you had these spectrograms, and he would play around with these spectral charts. Sure. But the difficulty was when uh, we said to him, come on, Gerard, you've got to write a line, you've got to write a song. Yes. Um, and it was terrifically <laughs> hard, it was a real effort to write a line, um, and of course, that exposed all the problems of character. There's the same thing um, with George Benjamin, um, uh, who was a colleague of Isaac King's as well, um, in which he said that uh, the one thing he wanted to avoid was anything as concrete as a musical idea with character. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, whether you think that's a positive negative or mm. negative negative mm. Uh, really depends how open you are uh, to these, uh, these ideas. So my question to you really was, shouldn't we really be talking about line as opposed to harmony? But I think you've more or less answered that. Well, we, we, my answer is that we should talk about both. But you see, it's, 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 the, um, it, it's the Schoenbergian idea of musical prose, yeah. which is really at issue here wh when line and rhythm and so on come into it. Uh, and that is the big advance or simply difference from <laughs> classical structuring um, and classical line formation and so on. Um, and that was something that um, I suppose Keller didn't formulate in that way. It, it, it came through from Schoenberg and on to Dahlhaus and so on. Um, and that has been done theoretically. But there's, uh, I think there's a lot of analytical mileage in it when you come to compare uh, what you find rhythmically in Haydn and what you find rhythmically in Bartok or Janicek, just thinking of string quartets, and, um, or even in Britain. And I mean, what you say about um, Hans's difficulty with Schoenberg, uh, there could have been a similar difficulty with Britain, but not, not to the same extent, because the, the possibility for overriding tonal backgrounds in Britain is, is I suppose, there. That, uh, it, it's more difficult to demonstrate their absence mm. in Britain than it is in Schoenberg. Um, but, but all these, um, th these differences between um, Schoenberg and Haydn are something I would have loved Keller to have explored, you know, uh, to have written a book with the title Haydn and Schoenberg, The Differences and, and uh, consequences or something. That would have been a real blockbuster. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Some, um, somebody at the back here has been waiting to... Uh, I think in, that, in, in, the, in the new book, there's, uh, he writes about Boulez, much the way you're talking about uh, Finnessy. Yeah. And of course, tying in with this gentleman's remark, he never writes anything about Debussy, I don't think. Yeah. He doesn't write about French music either. Mm. And his criticisms of, of, de, of yeah. Boulez seem to me as that he, the, the harmony is not functional. He's mm. interested in functional harmony and has problems with French music because 
spread through the literature without, you know, it's not, it's not as interested in functional harmony in the way Austro-German music is. And when he's writing about the Britain quartets, he finds a, uh, an exciting substitute for that in the way Britain does its sonata form, which he writes about in the second and the, and the third quartet. So, so that is outside his world. Non-functional harmony is, is not, not interesting. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. I think it's a shame to cause it characterless, but that's another issue. But I do feel very sorry for Hans because the second goes all the way through Britain. He must have had raging toothache for a whole life. <laughs> 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 well, they, 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 if I could just inject with yep. the, the toothache, uh, you know, notwithstanding... Jonathan's and Nick's reservation about the, and the metaphor uh, uh, the idea would be that the metaphor takes us too far away from music but I think in the I, I wasn't there at the Bath College in 1979 but to me that's a fascinating uh, report because that piece was so personal to Hans Keller it's dedicated to him he'd spent his you know, last 20 years lobbying Britain to write for him a quartet. It was dedicated to him. So it's the most purely joyful moment was getting this dedication. And Britain was the son of a dentist. And Britain knew Hans Keller very well. Uh, and I mean, Britain, I don't think he was in the inner circle. Few people were, but Britain and, and Keller had to do with each other for 20 years or more. And... Um, Britain nearly died of toothache in the 60s. You know, I mean, you read Paul Kildare's biography, you know, the toothache, uh, on the one, you'd think this is a trivial little metaphor, but I mean, <laughs> you know, death in Venice, that is what the quartet is about. Yeah. And the toothache was a very serious matter for Britain. And, and you know, there's a sort of very personal web of illusions around that particular metaphor. <laughs> Catastrophic though it would be in Parisian terms. So, well, so I have to push I never back. Use the word trivial. Really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Britain, Brussels. You know, it sounds writer. pathetic to call you know, speak of music yeah, as yeah, toothache. Exactly. Gentlemen, yeah. have you seen Paul Um He actually came to a concert when we played it, uh -huh. and the comments were out the next day. The. And he considered it not. <laughs> really? So, uh, and, and we know as players, mm. every bar has got textural problems. And he thought, you know, when you are looking at a quartet by John Berg or I don't know, Baker, he says that if you see, he, he just dismissed it, and yet he really admired the quartet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he would not. like to respond yeah, to that. I'd, I'd like to pitch something in there without being absolutely sure as I begin this sentence what the relevance of the end of it may be, but as some of you will know, and I know a lot about this and it doesn't matter how or why, uh, Hans was on the Leeds International Piano Competition jury once, and he fell out <laughs> with the entire jury <laughs> and with my no. teacher who was there chairman of the Leeds Piano Competition and made a public fuss about this as well. And what, what I, I remember very well as, as a young musician at the time being fascinated, we, it would be wrong for us to name names, the history of this can be read about. But the artist that Hans Keller was passionately convinced should win every piano competition, not just the Leeds, on that particular occasion. 
was what we might justifiably call a classic Moscow school trained Russian pianist. Mm. Isn't that fascinating? Mm. Uh, yeah. Not <coughs> an artist that would normally be called idiosyncratic. Uh, or how, how can I say this in a respectful way? The kind of person that you might turn the radio on and not recognize her playing, and I just said her deliberately, it's a hard to identify. Um, so I think this idea that's been emerging here where Hans is not here to defend himself, <laughs> <laughs> that this man had a kind of certain normative, reductive, um, cultural baggage that was very, very important to him as part of his critical apparatus, it's kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I for one, <coughs> admire the fact that he was willing to stand up in public uh, at least in respect of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in the least competition that makes or breaks an international career for a number of people every three years. It continues to do so. It did in 1969. Well, he, he had a great career. Victoria Postnikova. Yeah. 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 It's Violin Concerto. Oh, yeah. That's the one you really admire. That's right. Yeah. That so uh, yeah. comment uh, about Finnessy is interesting because I think it would have come from a period where he was active at the BBC on the uh, the, the reading panel. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, see, so I mean, there was a point in his career where he was working on chamber music uh, and could stay within, uh, you know works he felt very deeply about and then he was doing symphonic stuff he did the edu and then um he was with the reading panel for a, um yes but I, I, so he I was think so by the time he was making this sort of judgment he'd yeah. he'd retired well you know, bit, that's you right. know, i, I think this, he felt more able to make mm. to to describe someone as characterless um in in his last years and than he did before. Not, when did he retire from you? I mean, around 1980? 79. Yes, yes. Well, um, I, I think in some ways it's similar to Adorno, who's 20 years older, uh, although Adorno at Darmstadt was, you mm. know, talking to Stockhausen and writing about Stockhausen. Yeah. I don't think those, that generation, were quite able to keep up with what was going on with uh, no, no. Gurr, Maxwell Davis, and then mm. Finnessy and Nussen. You know, I mean, they, were, they went to the concerts, but... I mean, Keller is really debating Schoenberg, who is a, a composer of three generations earlier back. Yeah. So, well, um, yeah. but every, anything he has to say is always somewhat perceptive. I mean, uh, you know, I think okay. if one looks mm. at Finnessy's yeah. music, the, yeah. He, yeah, he's right. It's sort of blocks of material, but not the harmony within the blocks doesn't necessarily have a dynamic sort of. It's not where the actions act in that no. music. No, no. Right. Yeah. I've got two questions actually. One is about um, do you think when Keller talks about Arno Schoenberg, do you think that he's talking, having in his mind the Schoenberg, the historical Schoenberg or the personal Schoenberg? Hmm. No, no, I didn't hear the question. Did, is Keller talking about the historical or the personal Schoenberg? Uh, 
Is, is that yeah, and your question? Yeah, mm, or thinking of the historical? Because, because um, Shen back towards the, the you know, late uh, end of his life, um, he had already gained the, the, the kind of historical significance in, in the means of history. Mm -hmm. And uh, Li Kanyunlin, who, who was um, one of the later disciples of Schoenberg, had um, sort of, when, when she, she studied with Schoenberg, she knew him personally, of course, and, and she was very close to him. But then later on, when she moved on to do her PhD in the University of Columbia, she had to look at her own teacher as a historical figure to write her thesis. So I wonder if that's the same case with Keller. He certainly, at, at, from my perspective and from, from what he actually wrote about Schoenberg, as I quoted around the time of the centenary, uh, this was very much the historical role that Schoenberg had had thrust upon him by by history, by by the time, and so the um, polarity between being the confuser and the clarifier mm -hmm. um, was, uh, I think, a very telling um, way of, of expressing that. I'm not saying it says everything that can be said about Schoenberg's, or even about, dare I use the term, Schoenberg's harmony, mm -hmm. uh, or his way of creating texture. But um, it, it shows a, um, a continued commitment because if you go back to the music survey when Schoenberg was still alive and Keller was in contact with him, uh, uh, correspondence and so on, and there's some fascinating stuff in, in Alison's and, and Susie's book about this. Um, uh, in a sense, Schoenberg was always living for Keller. I think you know he was he was that was the image they had of someone. And right at that time, in the late 1940s, when people like Boulez were coming along and, and uh, dismissing it as rubbish, <coughs> uh, in effect. So um, that was really the the watershed uh, around 1950, and I think everything after that. Um, was a disappointment perhaps um, uh, because the potential was not being fulfilled. Um, Happy, I think you wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent, following on from the question about um, line and accent, um, Keller thought of himself as uh, being didactic towards performers, telling them how they should perform and whether perhaps um, his essays were kind of prototype of what we might now think of as performance analysis. Um, this was one of the questions actually that I had prepared. I only prepared questions in case the angels were passing with the side of the stairway so there would be something I have to say. But your questions have always been, have been much more interesting, um, I have to say. But it was uh, one of the questions um, because we're about to publish a book, uh, I've raised <laughs> the cover, uh, Beethoven's String Quartet in B-flat major that will come out later th uh, this year. Um, uh, and um, if there's a chapter in that which is taken from the unfinished book uh, on Beethoven that Susie mentioned, uh, it won't, it's not a complete book, uh, it's just a torso, um, and it's got three chapters finished, of which only the first two are anything like uh, readable. And uh, in this book, I'm producing the second chapter because the first goes over a lot of others. Now, uh, the chapter is called String Quartet Playing, and uh, if you are a string quartet player, for example, and you want to know what uh, you're going to learn uh, from Keller, he says two things study and improvise. Um, and that is, you've got to know the music well. Um, and a lot of string quartets, uh, with some honourable exceptions in this room, but they don't actually study what's on the page and in front of them uh, carefully enough. That has been my experience, and I say that very modestly. Um, but you study that, but also improvise, and the idea that, uh, uh, that the phrases are shaped in particular ways um, uh, is, uh, is central because it's going to be uh, a part of the discussion that is going on inside this group therapy that is a string quartet. And he says the other person is never wrong. So, for example, if the viola player then plays a phrase in a particular way, the first violin, the Levant say, will have to uh, somehow respond to that. 
and uh, make something of it. So I would then say, um, actually, that Hans, uh, what Hans says in that is, uh, I'm more sympathetic to that view than to some sort of armchair uh, performance in which you might say this accent here, this accent here, this accent there. Um, and that takes us back to the question about um, uh, accents generally. Now, uh, the naughty question that I asked uh, in Le Bon at the Wigmore Hall last Saturday um, was, uh, would he agree with Alfred Brendel, who said, no, you mustn't do uh, what Ke Keller does and have one principal accent in every phrase because you're going to make people very self-conscious and produce mm -hmm. a mannered uh, performance. But just think of how Stuck then goes from home, have whole passages in music when there was no <coughs> accentuation at all. Or if, for example, you listen to the third movement of Britain's Quartet, where you've got a solo violin uh, floating away, where's the accentuation going to be in that? If you put in accentuation, then uh, you're going to destroy the um, characters of the music, I would suggest. Uh, so I would say that uh, Hans's uh, contribution is to make us think of very carefully about uh, accentuation, the big issue of accentuation, and uh, Philip has drawn that out extremely well today. Um, but I would find the uh, detailed prescription um, uh, 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 challenging to the ethos he wants to establish with string quartets where people are constantly improvising. Uh, is that an answer? Yes. I was going to ask you what the was. Oh, sorry. I just say leading on to after supper tonight when uh, we'll be at Clare Hall, I will be talking about his work at the Mendelian School. Mm. And, and his teaching in those last years. I hope he'll be there to, to chime up. <laughs> and uh, so, he, and in those last years, teaching became very central to what he was doing in, in, in the last four or five years of his life. Mm -hmm. so we, uh, I, I have an, uh, my eye, as I must have, on the time. Um, we've been reminded of Keller's 11th commandment, and it's every chairman's job to know when to tell people to shut up. Mm -hmm. And I think that, <laughs> with, as respectfully as I can, I think that, that <laughs> moment has come. So could we please thank Jonathan Arnold, <laughs> Christopher. <laughs>